Hi, everybody. Um, we're about to hear from someone who I have some things in common with, so I get to introduce. My name is Becky Anderson, and um, I've been helping with Liberty Forum this year. And um, about a year and a half ago, uh, my husband and I started eating in a different way. And um, that has drastically changed our lives. We um, lost almost 100 pounds combined, feel a lot better, have more energy. And um, it's probably no surprise to a lot of you that uh, we follow like a primal paleo lifestyle. And um, even Jack Spirko mentioned uh, the way that he eats last night at the keynote dinner. Um, I think uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's mostly uh, vegetables, meats, fruit, and nuts, no grains and legumes. That's the very basic version. Um, and when I f found out about this new way to um, eat and live my life, uh, I realized there are a lot of parallels to the way I found out about um, liberty. Because before I became what I consider a voluntarist, um, I never paid much attention to the government because it didn't make sense. It seemed like there was a lot of conflicting information and it didn't seem to affect me and it was just boring and confusing. Um, and that's also kind of how I felt about all the diet information I would read that the, you know, mainstream uh, government information about how I should eat doesn't really make sense and it doesn't seem to click with me. Um, so, um, when I found out about uh, liberty movement and voluntarism and Ron Paul and anarchism and all that stuff, it clicked and it started making sense and so it became interesting. And um, that's exactly the same way I felt when I found out about the primal diet and, um, you know, suddenly when it makes sense, it becomes something that you want to do and then you can see the benefits and cycle and it works. Um, it's been really easy to convert people to a different way of eating because you can see the results. I wish that there was something you could see, um, you know, on the outside when you start becoming a voluntarist because, you know, if you lost weight when you became a voluntarist, everyone would be asking what you did, and then it's a great conversation opener. Um, so the um, person who's about to speak up here also changed his life drastically, way more drastically than I did, um, by changing his diet and his lifestyle. And um, when he got excited about how well it worked and wanted to help other people do the same thing, um, the government tried to shut him up. And um, he's still talking. So I'm really excited to hear what he has to say today. Uh, he blogs at diabetes-warrior.net. And uh, I'd like to welcome Steve Cooksey. Thank you, Becky. First of all, I'd like to thank Chris Lawless for inviting me here. Number one, um, I've learned so much. I've been exposed to a lot of the concepts of anarchy and limited government, and I leaned a libertarian through much of my life, but I've been exposed to so much more since this um, case broke. But uh, this week, uh, this weekend, it's been... Um, uh, very concentrated and, and very enjoyable. So I thank him because I've been able to share my story with people uh, like you. I've been able to learn much, and, and it's been energizing to be here this week. So thanks to Chris. And also, I'd like to thank the Institute uh, for Justice. They've taken uh, my case, and uh, they've done, they do that for uh, citizens of the United States, and they advance the cause of liberty and freedom. freedom excuse me. And as Jack mentioned last night, the defense of freedom anywhere is a defense of freedom everywhere. So congratulations to the Inst Institute of Justice and congratulations to the Liberty Forum as well. So I just want to thank <laughs> this group. I want to thank Becky for the introduction. I want to thank Nathaniel for being the uh, slide uh, progressor. So I'm going to just start talking. Uh, do we want governmental control of nutritional speech? Now, I know 
I know that given this group that the answer is no. Right. So my story began. Uh, I started writing this blog, diabetes-warrior.net, and uh, I started helping people. And as I told some people earlier, when you, when you help change somebody's, li- uh, change somebody's lives, uh, changing lives, it's empowering, it's, and it's a drug for me now. That's my new drug. So if you will advance the slide, Nathaniel. So why am I here? Who is Steve Cooksey? Okay. Um, I had a diabetes diagnosis in February of 2009. I started blogging in earnest in 2010. My site was investigated January of 2012, and that's really why I'm here or how I became noticed. Um, the um, news about the, uh, the state uh, investigation of my website and them, the, uh, the state telling me to, to be quiet um, uh, gave me a lot of press and a lot of publicity. Um, and I put this at the bottom so everybody would know that I'm, I might give out medical advice here. I might even give some nutritional advice, but I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist, and I'm not a dietitian, okay? So if you'll advance the slide, please. All right, the shoes. Can everybody see this? Can we dim the lights? Would that be possible? I'll just, I'll just talk. All right, this is a picture of me uh, under an umbrella on the beach. And you can't see... But I have, uh, I'm wearing shoes. Uh, I'm wearing uh, high top tennis shoes. Can you see the shoes? That's the main point of this picture. But uh, prior to my diabetes diagnosis, I wore shoes when I was awake. I had plantar fasciitis. I would wake up and my feet would be sore even with shoes for a good 30 minutes until they loosened up. But as you can see now, I wear, I go barefoot every chance I get. I, I don't go barefoot at work. Um, but I do, I run barefoot, I walk, I do, um, I run sprints on, at uh, high school football fields. Uh, last fall, I ran 100 miles in 30 days barefoot. Most of that was on grass, but a good portion of it was on roads. The most that I've run at one single time barefoot is 6.6 miles on pavement. And as you know, I'm a diabetic. I'm in the highest risk group for uh, neuropathy for lower limb amputations. Um, A lot of diabetics wear diabetic shoes. There's a lot of money to be made in diabetic shoes, diabetic socks, diabetic creams. Um, Along my way, I've had many cuts and bruises. Um, I'm gonna step to the side over here. You can see I've, I've had some serious cuts and scrapes along the way. And not at one time have I taken a drug for it Not at one time have I put a salve or an antibiotic or any of that on it. I I just, my uh, immune system, I think, is is running pretty well, and my body just takes care of itself. Uh, I was going to get into this a little bit later, but I have been drug-free since March of 2009. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you'll advance the slide. Um, That's me um, at one of my highest weights. I had a, a nice um, Michelin tire around the, the middle there. I was giving the peace sign. I'm not sure why I was doing that at the time. I was certainly not free. I was not free from drugs at that time. Uh, I put my um, email address at the bottom so I can collect your name for a contact list. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I've got this. This is a PowerPoint presentation, and I've got links like you see at the top there. So if there's someone that's, if you're interested, you can email me and I'll send you the PowerPoint presentation, okay? If you or someone you know has diabetes. And I should say at this point that I do believe that if you're taking drugs, if you suffer from an illness, you should give this meal plan a, a try, mainly because it's low in, infl- uh, it's a low inflammation meal plan, okay? And by lowering your inflammation, you're giving your body the opportunity to, to heal itself, okay? Okay, please advance. Okay, this is my clinical assessment record. Now, I'm very much aware that so much can be forged and faked on the internet, but I try to give as much proof um, about what I'm uh, testifying to. And this was in February of 2008, which was um, uh, a year before my diabetes diagnosis. 
And you probably can't see it very well, but 235 was my highest recorded weight. I feel certain that I was much higher than that or some higher than that, but that's my highest recorded weight. Pulse is given, different things like that. And then my blood pressure is 150 over 88. So I was a sick person. Um, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Go ahead, please. All right, uh, there's a link, another uh, link from about my story. I'm not going to go into all the details. On the left was a picture of an obese Steve Cooksey. And then on the right was my picture 10 months after I had started eating a low-carb, high-fat diet, um, which Becky um, correctly called a paleolithic, or excuse me, a paleo or primal meal plan. So that's, um, that's the results in, in about 10 months. That picture on the right was the fall of 2009. Okay. That picture was about a year and three months ago, about 14 months ago. That's a size small t-shirt. Um, that's one of the workouts that I would do is go to the high school. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Uh, that picture, uh, I like to cut up and have fun, but this picture was my Halloween picture this past year. Um, go ahead, Nathaniel. That's me on the uh, high school track. I love to go to high schools, okay? I'm, I don't, um, if you go to a gym, um, that's great, more power to you, whatever works for you. But uh, I, I've been to a gym a few times um, in recent years, but most of my exercise is done outside uh, and inside as well, but it's done without weights. Uh, I do have uh, some dumbbells and things like that, but the vast majority of my stuff, my workouts are done with body weights and uh, whatever equipment or things are available, and we'll see some more later, but here, well, that's okay, just leave it right there, but you saw me, I was running track barefoot, okay, and here's another thing too, it was outside and I had my shirt off, so I was getting that dangerous uh, sunlight, okay, and I say that jokingly because I think if you eat properly, sunlight is beneficial to you. This was just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the football team leaves the sled out, so I push the sled. And one of my favorite workouts is 120 yards of pushing a sled, 120 tire flips, which is a tractor tire that uh, I flip 120 times. And then I do 120 yards of bear crawls. And um, one of the things I do, um, I took a picture of my feet earlier, but I like to take a picture like this. I'm not showing off my feet. I'm not showing up my scarred. I'm not showing off my scarred up legs. But I'm just showing that that's what I do. I'm just giving more evidence to people who follow me on Facebook or Google Plus that this is the way I do. I mean, this is what I do, and this is the way I eat. Um, so anyway, go ahead, Nathaniel. And this is my most prized picture in this whole PowerPoint presentation. Okay. 75, and I'm a diabetic. I take no drugs. I'm not just diabetic drug-free. I'm total, totally drug-free. And, and I was an insulin-dependent diabetic. I took four shots a day just to survive, okay? And now, drug-free, insulin-free, and that's 75. I mean, there's a lot of people who would love to have a 75. And there's, and there's more people in this country that could have a 75, Okay, if they would just not listen to the medical industry, and we'll, we'll get to that. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, this is a picture of my overnight fasting blood sugar. So thank you. Go ahead, Nathaniel. All right. Uh, diabetes diagnosis. And as I said earlier, February 15, 2009, um, on the 14th, um, I told my wife I was, a after months of being chronically ill, after having respiratory infections that turned into bronchitis or walking pneumonia, on the night of the 14th, I told my wife, Tammy, you're going to have to take me to the doctor. We had urgent care. It was a Saturday night. And I said, if they can't help me, you're going to take me to the hospital. Well, I didn't have to worry about that because we got to the doctor's office and they rushed me to the hospital. I had a blood sugar over 700, um, 740 the best I remember, but I never, I, I don't have that documented. But uh, they told me that I was likely to be on drugs and insulin for the rest of my life. 
I suffered from diabetes despair. And the reason I use that term is because on both sides of my uh, family, my maternal and paternal grandmothers were diabetic. One was a type 1 diabetic, one was a type 2. The type 1 diabetic died a painful, horrible, slow death with the amputations. Okay, The type 2 diabetic, she died a slower death, but after strokes, uh, bypass surgeries, uh, I used to go and uh, back when she was a diabetic, they had the, the uh, bottles of insulin that she kept in the refrigerator. And she would just sit there and just cry because she couldn't eat that low-fat, low-calorie diet. And it just tore her up inside because she was a failure in, in her eyes. And uh, so anyway, um, I had diabetes despair, and I started looking. I went out on the Internet, and I tried to find, because I was going to fight this thing. You know, I was going to beat diabetes. I was going to be a good diabetic. And everywhere I went, there was depression, um, and people were, people coddled and cuddled and enabled diabetics to eat a high-carb diet. If you go there now, you'll see people whining and complaining about all the diseases and the discomfort that they're having and the pain and suffering, and it's very depressing. So I, I kept looking. And then I found out what, I found out that lowering carbs helped, okay? And so I was, I, I had this feeling of euphoria. I wanted to go out and share it. I wanted to tell the world all about it, right? Go ahead, Nathaniel. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go through quick because I know I'm, I'm um, running a little long on time. Um, the prior 18 months, prior to my diabetes diagnosis, Okay, um, I was on drugs, and I have the post here, that, that link, you can go, and I've actually got labels, pictures of labels with my name on the, the drugs, so you can tell it was a prescription to me. But uh, I won't list all those, but you can see them down below there, it's just a, a small list, but uh, go ahead, Nathaniel. Then here's the elements that, the ailments that I had, okay, high blood sugar, I was on, uh, I had hypertension, I had high cholesterol, I had bronchitis, asthma, plantar fasciitis, a few things that aren't on there as well, but go ahead, Nathaniel. So <clears throat> I went out and I wanted to tell the world what I'd found because at that point, you know, there wasn't a lot of talk about paleo or primal, okay, certainly not in treating diabetes. So I thought it was just a matter of ignorance. I'm ignorant on a lot of matters, okay. James uh, talks about a lot of things I'm ignorant on, okay. There's nothing wrong with being ignorant about subjects, but I just thought it was a matter of ignorance, but it wasn't. They knew about low carb, and when I say they, I'm talking about the diabetes industry. So I was banned, blocked, ridiculed, and mocked, and I couldn't share what I had discovered. So that's when I decided to start my own blog so that people couldn't shut me up. Go ahead, sir. And that, um, so what I did over the next two years was I, I took people on. I, uh, I attacked the American Diabetes Association routinely. Um, I attacked, uh, there, there are certified diabetes educators and nutritionists and, and dietetics who are well known within their circles and I would take them on and I would um, uh, criticize them and, and uh, suggest better ways to do things. And um, in January of 2012, I decided to take it to the streets, you know, the Doobie Brothers song. That was my inspiration. But uh, so I said, I'm going to take it to the streets. So I went to a local nutritional seminar. It was um, being, um, the, the talk was being given by a certified diabetes ed educator. And she was obese. Okay. And she was a type 2 diabetic. And she was insulin resistant. Now, for you that may not know what that means, um, Type, two, uh, type 1 diabetes is essentially uh, when the pancreas shuts down and the body doesn't have enough insulin to remove the blood sugar out of the, the bloodstream, okay? Type 2 diabetes is essentially insulin resistance, okay? The, the body is producing, the pancreas is producing insulin, but because of the insulin resistance, it has to produce more and more. So this lady uh, was a type 2 diabetic and insulin um, and um, she was insulin dependent, so she needed insulin to live. And so she was teaching people on how to duplicate her example. Do you follow me, what I'm trying to say? She's teaching people how to be like her, and that's the worst example you want. 
because here, remember this, in February of 2009, I was insulin dependent, okay? And I chose a different way. And instead of eating whole grain breads and continuing to eat cookies, cakes, pasta, rice, everything that they suggest, and instead of eating a low-fat meal plan, I went the other way, just like Jack was talking about last night. He said, he, he was, uh, Jack, what's Jack's last name? Thank you. Well, he said last night that, you know, he needed to lose weight, so he decided to look at what the government said and do the opposite. <laughs> right? Right? Well, I didn't look at it that way, but that's, in it, that, that's what I did. That's how I ended up doing it. Okay? Well, so I went to this nutritional seminar, and I could not sit on my hands while she, this lady is telling people, she's comparing, this will be funny to some of you, okay? Hopefully. But she's comparing two, piece, two loaves of bread, okay? One is whole grain. Ooh. And then the other is not whole grain, white, yeah. Wonder bread. Wonder bread, yeah. I wonder what's in it. So when you compare them, she's saying like, this one has three more grams of fiber. Uh, that's nothing. That means nothing to a diabetic. It's going to jack your blood sugar up regardless, okay? Even Dr. Oz knows this now. He, was, uh, he interviewed Dr. Davis a couple of weeks ago, and they compared bread to a Snickers. There's not a lot of difference in most people. I'll just leave it at that. I'm, I'm rambling. Okay. So I was investigated because someone at that meeting reported my website. So I was reported to the North Carolina Board of Dietetics and Nutritionists. Ooh, spooky. So uh, there's a link to the investigation uh, updates, but uh, go ahead, Nathaniel. The investigation. Um, the state investigated my website, and they told me, that I could not give guidance. And, and here's some of the things that they said. If I answer a diabetic specific question, I need a license. Okay. Now keep in mind, I was drug and insulin dependent. Okay. I lost 78 pounds. I'm off all drugs and insulin and diabetics come to me. Okay. And I can't answer a question. What the hell country is this? Okay. What the, what the hell are we talking about? I can't tell diabetics to lower their carb consumption to get their blood sugar in, under control. Number two, giving specific advice, counseling, advising requires a license. All right. I have friends that I've made through social media. Okay. They come to me with their questions. I can't answer their questions. It's just ridiculous to me. Number three, must, um, oh, this is a quote that I had, must first and foremost obtain and maintain normal blood sugars, okay? Diabetes is a disease of high blood sugar, okay? High blood sugar poisons every cell in the body at toxic levels, all right? So everybody should want to obtain and maintain normal blood sugars, but I can't say that, okay, Nathaniel? Uh, since when is it against the law to tell people to just eat real foods? And breads, cakes, cookies, cereals, pasta are not real foods. That's my opinion, okay? Since when is it against the law to tell people to eat meats and vegetables? When is it, since when is it against the law to obtain and maintain normal blood sugars or to tell people to do that? And then why me? Why am I doing this? Um, I, I wrote a blog post. There's a medical study that came out several years ago. 90% of diabetics fail. And... That if, if you know many diabetics, you know that that's true because so many of them don't have normal blood sugar. So it, the system is flawed. It's failing. So what, what does the government do? What, what do these major diabetic groups do? Nothing. They keep preaching the same low-fat, high-carb, grain-based meal plan. If doctors, nutritionists, dietitians were telling the, the, the diabetics, the truth, I wouldn't have to, but they're not. If I or others like me do not tell diabetics there is a better way, who will do it? Why do doctors, nutritionists, and dietitians not tell the truth? Go ahead, sir. Tainted nutritional studies. Failed the smell test. You see the dog smelling the um, fire hydrant? Yeah, I was kind of proud of that one. Um, but this is a this is a, a blog post where I talk about this study, and this is, you know, I know you people d don't think this way, but there's so many people I know I did who thought that nutritional, I mean, the food companies wouldn't poison us, drug companies wouldn't sell us drugs that are harmful, right? So I looked at this study. Number one, I'm, I'm gonna leave number one for last. Who been a, anytime you see a study, you, you see the headlines. 
you need to ask these questions. Who benefits from the study? All right. And in this study, it was a study about um, snacking. The study found, now listen to this, the study found that snacking between meals is not a risk factor for obesity. So it's saying that it's okay to snack in between meals, right? And if you think about it, it makes sense because we're told all the time, at least diabetics are, eat four to six smaller meals a day. Okay, now think about that for a second. You want to eat carbs four to six times a day and keep your, pan your uh, pancreas pumping insulin, right? No, no, you want to rest it. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting off topic. In this study that said that snacking between meals was not a risk factor for obesity, who paid for the study? Frito-Lay. <laughs> Frito-Lay. And, and, you know, go to my, I'm not pushing my website, but go to my website and look, at, look this up. I'm not making this up. Frito-Lay funded the study. Now, if you looked at the article about the study, you wouldn't see Frito-Lay there, okay? You had to go to the abstract of the study, okay? And then... Uh, and let me just say, PepsiCo owns Frito-Lay, so PepsiCo is part of the problem. That'll be important as we talk later. Um, okay, who benefits from the study? Frito-Lay. History of the researchers. If you read this post, that's one of the things that I look at, too. Um, most articles will at least say who, who the researcher was, and you can look, up, look them up uh, thanks to Google. But the three researchers uh, on this one study had a long history of doing low-fat, high-carb, grain-based, uh, heart-healthy uh, research. So for them to find something totally opposite of that is not something that's likely to happen, um, just from what I've seen. So who paid for it? Frito-Lay. Who benefits? Frito-Lay. History of the researchers, it was unlikely that any um, result other than the one that they found would, would uh, come to place. But... That's just an example of tainted nutritional studies that have been propping up this failed nutritional policy that's harming all of us, okay? Go ahead. Would you believe, would you believe, and that's the old get smart thing, would you believe, okay, that's not a good impression. <clears throat> In 2008, and this is off the uh, American Diabetes Association website, the public information, $19 million were paid to the American Diabetes Ass in 2008. I'm sorry. A, 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 yeah, association. I'm sorry. Okay, and that was just by Big Pharma, okay? If you click on that link, it'll take you, I, I think the next slide. Go ahead. Go ahead. Nothing. Yeah, here we go. American Diabetes, oh, I left off the period there, Ass's uh, sponsors. Medtronic, Merck, I'm not going to read them all. You can look at them later, but that's just big pharma. That doesn't include big food. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Okay, there we go. All right. The American dietetic ass. I'm sorry. Does that offend anybody? Okay. I, I, I love saying it, okay? <laughs> the American dietetic ass, uh, they changed their name, and I'm not sure why, but they changed their name to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. The Academy, that sounds like there's actually some study and research and some really serious science going on there, right? Well, did you know that Kellogg's is a major contributor to the American dietetic ass, to the American diabetes ass? Did you know that? Absolutely. Well, their whole line, they've, they've uh, anyway, if you look at the very bottom of that picture, it's 24 grams of carbs, I believe. That's more carbs than I eat in a day, okay? Typically two days. But that's in one meal, okay? Um, then you add a half a cup of milk. Have you ever had Kellogg's Frosted Flakes with a half a cup of milk? Oh, my God. I mean, you, you need one or two, right? And, and cups of milk are 11 to 14 grams of carbs per. So you're looking at a substantial amount of carbs in a meal that will maybe last an hour or two, but then after your blood sugar soars and you, the, the insulin pumps in and redu pulls the blood sugar out, your blood sugar drops and then you get hungry again, okay? Uh, and this is a good time to bring this up, I guess. My last meal was dinner last night and um, I ran twenty I ran the stairs for 20 minutes this morning and I've got plenty of energy. So we don't need carbs to live, okay? We don't. It's okay if you do. I'm not, I'm just saying you don't need them, that your body does not require them. Go ahead, please. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's one of my favorite quotes. 
In this article, you are appointing who? All right, this is an article, article by Jeffrey Smith from the Huffington Post where he says the person who may be responsible for more food-related illness and death than anyone in history has just been made the U.S. food safety czar. This is no joke. Go ahead, Nathaniel. If GMOs are indeed responsible for massive sickness and death, then the individual who oversaw the FDA policy that facilitated their introduction holds a uniquely infamous role in human history. That person is Michael Taylor. Michael Taylor had been Monsanto's attorney before becoming policy chief at the FDA. Soon after, he became Monsanto's vice president and chief lobbyist. So, uh, and in this article, he says the, the fox is guarding the hen house, and it, that's what the hell we have now. Okay? Go ahead. This month, Michael Taylor became the senior advisor to the commissioner of the FDA. He is now America's food safety czar. What have we done? What are we doing? What are we... We know that government, when, when governments control things, we know that man, men, people will attempt to control that, okay, so that they can profit from it and gain more power. So that's what's going on here. Do we want governmental control of our nutritional speech? Not no. Hell no. And that's what we have. That's what we have. That concludes my presentation. I want to thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Very kind. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Uh, this gentleman on the far left. Uh, did you run across Dr. Bernstein? Yes, I, I did. Um, just uh, talking about my journey very briefly, um, uh, I, my doctor recommended a low glycemic index book, which I did. And I'm not saying anybody should go out and get a book on that because it, it only takes you a third of the way of where you need to go. But uh, along that journey, I discovered MarksDailyApple.com and he... Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. Mark's... Uh, He's a great guy. All right, uh, but then I did find Richard Bernstein, and that was some great verification for me, confirmation. Here's an MD who goes and teaches other doctors and other diabetics on how to live, um, and he promotes a paleo-style uh, meal plan as well. Thank you, sir, for bringing that up. Yes? Um, you, you talk, obviously, you were diagnosed with diabetes. Mm -hmm. You've done all this fantastic work. Mm -hmm. Do you still consider yourself a diabetic or something? I love and hate that question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, the, uh, the gentleman asked if I still considered myself a diabetic. I do not believe that I've cured my diabetes, okay? Um, I took a home uh, test for it, um, a glucose tolerance test is uh, 75 uh, grams of uh, glucose, and I, I took table sugar, 75 grams of table sugar. And according to that, those results, I am no longer a diabetic, according to the medical industry, or, uh, according to their guidelines. I'm still insulin resistant. Uh, resistant. If I ate a Twinkie or something like that, God forbid, um, yeah, my blood sugar would still go up. It would, just like yours would do or anybody's would do, but mine would come down slower than um, a non-diabetic. Great question, though. So you're thinking they don't make Twinkies? Yeah, I, I don't know why I said that. Uh, I would never eat a Twinkies. But I'm 51. I'll be 52 in June. And thank you for asking that. I, I, I'm by far in the best shape I've been in since since high school or college, at least. Well, I was 47 in uh, in 09. Yeah. So early. I mean, well, that's the thing. Eating this way, we've got type one diabetics who are six months old now. We've got type one diabetics who are 40. We have type twos. There's children type twos. Is there? A, why is that happening? It's not because of anything we're eating. Can't be what we're eating. You know, it can't be the toxins in the food that we eat. No, it's got to be something else. It's because they're not exercising. Yeah, I'm joking. Yeah.
That's a great question. I know people who have lost weight with a low carb approach, a paleo primal approach. Um, but as far as what I've done, I don't want to seem like I'm bragging here, but I don't know anybody else that was insulin resistant, who was taking shots and drugs, okay, who's done what I've done with non-diabetic normal blood sugars, okay? Um, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I exercise five times a week, probably six, seven, six or seven times um, a, lot of, a lot of weeks. Um, I do uh, the way Mark Sisson talks about in a primal blueprint. I, I exercise intensely for shorter periods of time. I did 20 minutes on the stairs. It was, I had my heart pumping. I'm, I'm, I'm good for the day. So, but yeah, I, I, for me, it was twofold. Thank you. Yes, sir. Do this in conjunction with the doctors so that you do when it was safe to go off the internet. The question was, and I remembered this time, uh, is uh, the question was, did I do this in conjunction with a doctor? Uh, no, I did not. And um, my doctor is a good person. Okay. And he's the one that, I, I tell people he started me on this journey by letting me see that by reducing my carbs, I could lower my, my drug and insulin uh, needs. But he told me, and I can't remember, it was three or four months later, he said that, um, Steve, I w uh, two or three weeks later, he said, I would send you to a diabetes nutrition class, but you already know more than, than they do, obviously, because my blood sugars were coming down drastically. I mean, if you go to uh, 20 grams of carbs a day, your blood sugar will drop, I mean, if you're a diabetic, all right? So uh, I did not go. Um, I, I, I did it all on my own by self-experimenting and uh, doing it that way. Uh, this gentleman first. Uh, okay. What's with the bare feet? Why? Um, I do a lot of crazy things. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I do. Um, well, and here's the thing. A lot of th a lot of things, and I really get excited about this. Okay, but conventional ris conventional wisdom is usually wrong. You must eat four to six meals a day. Okay, you must wear shoes if you're diabetic. You, um, I'm drawing a blank now, but if you're a diabetic, you must wear shoes. You don't know the people. I mean, I have a lot of friends online. Steve, you should not. Oh no, you can't walk barefoot. And outside, you could step on a razor or uh, step on glass, which I have done. But because my blood sugars are normal, and this is, I did a post on this. Uh, when is a, a big toe, uh, when is a diabetic toe just a toe? And it's when you have normal blood sugars. Okay, you, I've had cut scrapes all over bottom. I've had really bad blisters on my feet. But they weren't diabetic blisters. They were just blisters. So why do I do it? I, I did it to show that, um, well, number one, Mark Sisson talks about it. Okay, um, um, I went from some uh, I went some from somebody who was wearing shoes when they woke up to the tw time they went to bed to now I love to run and jump. I ran a stairs barefoot, not a big deal, but I did it. Okay, I love it, and I love showing. It's just a way of showing that conventional wisdom is wrong. Yes, sir. I I'll get you next. I apologize. How do you respond to people who say, "Well, you need some carbs"? Well, and I have paleo friends who say that. Okay, and all I do. And the question was, what do I say when some people say that you've got to have carbs? I just say, I don't. I mean, my life is an open book. Um, Rob and Tammy, my friends, uh, can attest to this. I post my foods all the time, okay? Um, I just, I don't eat many carbs. Um, most of the time, there are days where I don't have any carbs. I went a whole week without any carbs from plants, um, uh, I would just say that for me, and this is what I try to be careful of. I don't say you can, you don't have to eat carbs. I don't say that. I say I don't need them. Okay. I, I, I believe that our body was designed that it in such a way that it did not re, uh, require carbs to live. I mean, I, I haven't eaten since last night, and uh, I had just the veggies, the salad, okay, and uh, and the meat, um, which was excellent, by the way. And here I am running stairs. I just don't need carbs. Uh, because I would say that my body is fat adapted. It's burning the fat that I have. I'm sorry, I've got to go to this gentleman over here. Yes, sir. Uh, 
face, I was going to ask the same question this government did. The daughter is in North Carolina, and that's where the tie goes out. So the Air Force can have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was going to say is what a lot of people understand, and, and by your experience, Steve, you can maybe touch base on this, is when I started staying away from the carbs, the carb influence died, and all of a sudden the reserve died. I stopped getting the headaches, I started, stopped getting the hunger cravings. I started burning the yellow fat, which is the bad fat, and it made me feel more energy. I have more energy now by staying away from that stuff that's supposed to be good for you according to the government. Conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you find the same thing? Did you find it help you? The question was, uh, the question was, did I experience the same thing he did, and that was increased energy and um, uh, stamina and different things like Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I feel so good right now. Now, part of it is an adrenaline rush for being up here on stage and talking uh, to you fine people, but uh, this morning, I mean, I had so much energy. I just wanted, and, and that's the way I feel most of the time. Yeah, if I go for two or three days and I don't sleep well, I'll, I'll be sluggish, okay? I'm not going to say I'm Superman all the time, but most of the time I'm ready to go. Let's, I enjoy life. And that's one of the things, thank you for bringing this up, because this is one of the things I say all the time online. I am thriving. I'm not just surviving. I know so many diabetics. I know so many people out in the world who are just living okay they're just surviving they're on drugs they're on so many drugs they can't even keep track of them all okay they're barely existing and i thrive i i find i try to find something every day to get enjoyment whether it's a sunrise a sunset different things i mean we i just hope that everybody could start thriving and enjoying life like i have yes sir uh, good question. Um, I um, I usually wake up around two or three in the morning, and I'll um, I'll go back to sleep for another two or three hours, give or take. And it's um that's mine. Yeah. The que and the question was, what is my sleep pattern? Yes, sir. What? Oh, um, yeah. Um, the lawsuit uh, we were turned away by the North Carolina uh, courts. And we've now appealed to the uh, U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals, the 4th District in Richmond. And I uh, hope to have a, um, a verdict or a decision by late spring, early summer. So it, it's moving on. It's moving on. And uh, if, if all goes well after this, this uh, spring, uh, the Supreme Court's next. And, you know, that's what I'm hoping for. Yes, sir. Great question. Um, on days that I don't work, uh, Saturday and Sunday, um, I, I usually eat when I'm hungry. That's that's what I would like to do. Um, but when I work, I usually uh, I, I never almost never eat breakfast. Okay, this isn't anything unusual. Me not eating breakfast. Um, I usually um, I, I do put uh, like coconut oil in my coffee. There's different things: coconut milk. Um, I'll, I do use a cream occasionally. Different things like that in my milk, but I, I rarely eat. Um, most days I eat lunch around 12, and then I eat dinner around 6, 7, 8, whenever I get home. Um, but occasionally, like today, is going to be a one-meal day. And I'm not hungry, so I'm not going to eat. Yes, sir. Um, it, it occurs to me that the consumption of carbs in general is a, is a, is a toxic addiction. Is that with your Are carbs a toxic addic addiction? Um, and I'm going to be careful with answering this because um, I have friends, paleo primal friends, who eat uh, yams, sweet potatoes, rice, things of that nature. And for them, carbs, some carbs are okay. I'm not going to sit here and say that carbs are, are toxic. I will say that they're toxic for me. Okay, because if I eat carbs, carbs convert into glucose, which is why I'm, I'm diabetic. Okay, I have, I, I can have uh, high blood sugar. Uh, I don't believe it. I don't. I don't believe the occasional consumption of small amounts of carbs are toxic to to people. Um, I would stay away from um, certain foods. You know, the the uh, processed foods. 
but even with people with healthy insulin mm -hmm. uh, function, you're, you get an insulin <laughs> spike, which is not a good thing. Right, right. I'm not, and I'm not. I'm just trying to. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a biologist. Um, just, and, and here's what I really try to do is just tell people what I do, you know. And um, so I'm not. I'm not going to say that a yam or a sweet potato or a banana, which is almost all sugar, I'm not going to say that that's bad for you. Okay. I'm just going to say I don't eat it and I don't need it. So. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's studies that have shown that uh, wheat does in fact. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. Could you repeat that? Uh, yeah, gluten containing grains do in fact uh, bind to the opiate receptors in the brain. And I believe uh, the NIH did a study and found that it's uh, addictive on the order of heroin. So, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm an old man, but you were you were saying that glutens uh, are addictive? Yeah, they, they bind to the opiate receptors in the brain, and they have opiate like. Uh, and the NIH has um, done studies that show that it is, can be addictive, um, equivalent to uh, heroin. Yes, and, and what, what the um, gentleman was saying is that he's read studies that NIH has done that grains are addictive and as, as addictive as heroin. And I, I've read similar studies. And, and I, I can tell you, um, from my perspective, grains are addictive. I've tried to help a lot of people, okay? And sugar is addictive, too. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm against artificial sweeteners. Um, there's a lot of reasons, but uh, the, the main reason is because it, it, it extends, in my opinion, it extends the, the uh, sugar sweetener addiction. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. What, what exactly is a doctor supposed to do with them? Like when some, some guy comes in there in the late 50s, abused the body for decades, and it's thank you that's that's a great question so the question was what's a doctor to do when he knows that 80 90 percent of uh, his patients would not be able to follow a diet similar to what i'm proposing and I've, I've debated doctors uh, online. I've debated certified diabetes educators. And that's a common, that's a common um, uh, reply that they make to me. They say, well, look, I don't even show it to them because I know they, they won't even do it. Well, number one, if that one person who might be able to do it is your mother or your daughter or your grandmother, I say, sure as hell, you would give it to her. You would tell her about it. So doctors that, that make that decision, in my opinion, are playing God. They're deciding, okay, I'm not even going to tell this person because I don't think they'll be able to quit eating Twinkies. Does that make any sense to me? No. They should tell everybody. I know that very few people today, on a percentage basis, will do what I do. You know, I try to tell every, I, I talk to people in, in the grocery store, on the football fields. I, I tell everybody about this, okay? Because I want to change, if I can change one life, if I can take one customer away from Monsanto or one customer away from PepsiCo, that's a, that's a win there. But changing lives is powerful. And so, you know, I can only imagine, hell yeah, I would t I'd tell everybody. And I would try to get them to do it because if 10% do it, then they can tell people and maybe get more people going. Um, I know it's an uphill battle. I know it. I, I live it every day. People I work with, I, there's a lady I work with. She's a diabetic. And every day I have to see her with the Bojangles bag or a, a bagel or cake or cookies. And she's sick and she won't listen to me. And she knows my story. Okay. Great question. Excellent question. The question was, do I take any supplements? Uh, I take vitamin D3, uh, and that's a very complicated story to just, uh, I won't give out a lot of advice here, except that I personally uh, was taking 4,000 IU in the summer and 8,000 in the winter, okay? Um, I, I quit taking it um, every day and now I'll take 10 or 15,000 two or three times a week. Now if I get sick, I'll take what I call mega doses. Um, and I guess I need to say what that is since I brought it up. Uh, but um, 
I follow a lady, who, um, the Animal Farm uh, blog. She's a PhD in pharmacology, and she's got a formula based on body weight. And um, so I, I take mega doses when I get really sick. Yes, sir. When you say you live it every day, what do you mean? Are you, are you still feel like you're addicted? Or? Oh, no, and that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. I am no longer addicted to sugar, grains, cakes, cookies. They don't bother me at all. Would I like to eat a Snickers right now? Yeah, I, I would like to, I guess, but I, I am not addicted any longer, so that's not what I meant. What I meant was I live, at, um, I live with the, um, the fact that people won't listen to me, that people won't see my, ex my, my example and, and, and try to do it. They... They're still addicted to grains and sugar. It, it is so addictive. And it's like uh, somebody, um, I've had alcoholism in, in my family. And uh, so I, I've, I know what that's like to live with. And it must be very similar um, in, in the power because people just can't give it up. Pizza. Oh, yeah. Well, and I'm glad you said that. You said pizza was good, right? I said pizza is very addictive. Oh, it is, yeah, it is. It is Pizza it is very addicting. And this is something I want to tell everybody. I'm glad you said that because if you Google your favorite recipe with paleo or primal, you'll find so many complimentary, um, um, uh, what's the word, substitutes, okay? One of my favorites is uh, uh, the cauliflower, cauliflower crust pizza, okay? There's that. They've got they've they've got people that make uh, pizza crust out of uh, chicken and cheese and parmesan. I mean, there's so many things out there. One of my favorite. Uh, I love to make uh, primal chili. It's what I call primal chili is really without corn and um, beans, and and I cut the tomatoes, uh, chopped tomatoes way down. But I'll take a um, um, spaghetti. Uh, excuse me. I'll take a yellow summer squash and a mandolin stringer and string it. And it makes a nice um, substitute for pasta. And I'll cook it in butter and garlic, okay, in a pot, and just and then I add that primal chili on top of it. Oh, mmm, it's good. It's good, real good. Yes, sir. Have you been conditioned to have carbs as appetizing from a basic sustenance standpoint? Okay. Thank you for asking that question. There's so many great questions. Okay. I, I wrote a post about this, okay? Baby formula. It's crazy, okay? I compared a dairy creamer, the ingredients of dairy creamer, the, the powder. It's very similar. It's not identical, but it's very similar, okay? Yes, we are addicted. A good friend of mine, uh, she had, um, and I'm going to say this wrong, can't believe I'm going to say this on air, but uh, she had two C-sections, okay? She's a diabetic. She had two C-sections, all right? Her third, I helped her with her diet, and she had a vaginal birth, VBAC, VBAC, VBAC. I just said vaginal. <laughs> um, but, but... Because uh, the point was being is that so many babies are larger now that there's more C-sections, and it's because the mothers are eating grains, they're eating sugars, and so the babies are bigger, and the babies have been getting, um, uh, the, the mothers in the hospital are encouraged to, um, uh, to, to, to use formula. They give them free samples of formula in the hospitals. And they say, oh, yeah, you know, use this. And they give them free coupons for uh, formula. So, yeah, we're getting grains. Uh, we're getting sugar while we're in the womb, I assume, if the mother has high blood sugar. That's an assumption on my part. Okay. But they're getting sugar when they're born. Okay. And then, you know, as soon as they're, um, if they are breastfed, but what's their first food they give them? It's grains. Okay. It's cereal. They give them that. And so, and then how long is it before they give them juice, okay, or chocolate milk or some crap like that? So, yeah, to answer your question, yes, sir, I believe that we, we are being conditioned to, um, to be carb addicts from before birth. Yes, sir. Uh, is your paleo diet on your website? Yes, sir. Um, Nathaniel, uh, can you go all the way back to the very first slide? And thank you for asking that. 
Um, okay, I'm going to step away. This is where I have meal plan information. If you want to hear more about me, <coughs> that's the important thing here. <laughs> so, that's more about me. Uh, this is about the investigation, but that's meal plan. And this is uh, some fitness videos. Uh, Mark Sisson. I just shared that link with somebody just the other day because this lady said, Steve, I can't even do one push-up, okay? Well, if you go to that uh, fitness link and click on it, uh, click on the primal fitness videos because Mark Sisson uh, gave us these videos free of charge, but like push-ups, for example, you do them against the wall. If you can't do a push-up, you do them against the wall and then lean against the table and then do them on the floor or, you know, you can do them on your knees, there's, but they're scalable to any fitness level, okay? So saying that you can't walk or you can't exercise, there are people that can't walk, and obviously that is an excuse, a legitimate excuse. Five minutes, okay, thank you. But um, what I was going to say is getting back to that uh, fitness link is that um, you know, there's, there's ways that people can exercise from day one. And let me just say how I started out. When I exited the hospital, I couldn't walk a mile, okay? I would walk... Um, down the street, into my street and back. And that's all I could do. But you know what I did? The, the next day, I walked to the next mailbox and the next mailbox. And once I could walk a mile, then I started jogging a little bit and then walking, jogging and walking. I try to jog more and more. And, um, you know, I, I make a big deal or I, I tell people a lot about how I exercise, but how I started out lifting weights, I was such a fine specimen. I used my wife's aerobic weights, eight pound dumbbells. That's how manly I was. You know, so what I tell people is it doesn't matter where you are, where you are today, but just start and just work to get better and stronger and, and fit every day. Just do a little bit more. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, one thing to comment that is not confusing about us humans, about our pets too, is that our pets are not going to be able to diagnose last year with diabetes. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. I'm so glad she said that. So many great comments and questions. The lady was talking about uh, pet food and how uh, this way of eating is not just for people. And um, I actually wrote a, a post about that. I've, I've written a post about so many things. But I talk about uh, one of the things that people like to say is that th this, this diabetes um, epidemic is because of fast food. And, and believe me, I'm no fan of fast food. But I talk about did you know that dog diabetes is at epidemic levels up like three or four hundred percent? Is that because dogs are going to McDonald's? No, it's because if you look at their dog food, it's and I forgot now it's in the post, but I think it's like 50 percent carbs or something like that. And even the, the protein that's in there is comes from junk food. So, yeah. Absolutely, positively, we, we, and I poisoned uh, many of my dogs. Um, we, we're, we're poisoning them by giving them a high carb diet, just like we're eating. And oh, and that reminded me of one of my favorite sayings. All right, Th does anybody think it's odd that the American Diabetes Association, the, Ameri Di the American Dietetics Association, is pushing the same diet, essentially a high carb grain based diet, that they they feed cattle to fatten them up for slaughter? I mean, does anybody see anything strange about that? And thank you for that snort. That's, that was, that is like the highest compliment I've gotten today. So thank you. But yes, thank you for saying that. Uh, dogs are, were designed to be carnivores and that's what we should feed them in my opinion. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm not going to touch that one. Um, well, from what I've been told, and I'm no expert on Atkins, but from what I've been told, 1972's version of uh, Atkins is the induction phase is very similar to the way I eat. Okay. Um, today, they have a lot of shakes and cookies and candy bars and stuff like that. 
I personally would not eat. They have uh, sugar alcohols. If you're diabetic, uh, depending on the person, uh, sugar alcohols can affect your blood sugar. So I would run from them. That's my opinion. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, and Mark Sisson um, talks about this, and this is where I really learned so much uh, is Mark's daily apple.com. But Mark talks about this, that when we eat a lot of carbs, okay, our blood sugar uh, rises, obviously, and the body sends resources to get the blood sugar out. So it's, it's spending resources there, right, to, to rid the, the sugar from the blood. And, and blood sugar is, okay, blood sugar is toxic at certain levels. I don't think anybody debates that. That's why diabetics have retinopathy and neuropathy and so on and so forth. But i got to wrap it up. Thank you so much. You've been great. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.